Great. Good morning, folks. Uh, it is uh, 11 o'clock Eastern, and we're about to uh, begin our fourth uh, component of our Chikai PM series. It's a beautifully warm day here. We've gone from snow flying at the beginning of this to uh, hot summery weather now. And um, I am delighted to uh, be introducing Alison Gardner uh, to you from the University of uh, Maine. And um, before we dive into the materials, there are a few things that I'd like to cover with you. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. I should introduce myself. My name is Jana Hexter, and I'm the Grants and Partnership Coordinator with uh, the Northeastern IPM Center. And um, this is being recorded, and we'll have an edited version of the recording available to you in about a week. And anyone who is registered for this webinar will get a copy of the recording, or if you're attending, you'll get a copy too. Um, so you should see an email come from me to, uh, from me to you in about a week, and uh, with that address um, is going to be the link. If you've missed some of the um, other um, in the series, other recordings in the series, they're all available there. So you could go to um, that link and you'll see the other ones that have been happening over the course of the spring and summer. Next slide, please. Um, so how we're going to do questions for this is we're not going to use the chat feature because it's too complicated for us to uh, keep track of when we have lots of people. So what we use is the Q&A feature. And if you scroll your mouse over the Zoom box, um, there'll be a bar that appears at the top or at the bottom. Um, and you'll see on there, there's like two um, rectangles together and it says Q&A. And if you click on that, um, you can ask a question and you can make it anonymous um, if you prefer. So there are no stupid questions and uh, we'll sort through them um, as Ali is presenting. And, um, and then we will mark which ones uh, that we can ask. We may not get to everything we'd like to, but it just depends on the number of questions that we have. Um, and this feature allows us to um, kind of sort through if there are three people that ask the same question, then we know to make sure that we have time to ask and have that question answered. And then we can mark all three as being answered. So it really helps us to keep track of, um, of the questions that are coming in. All right, um, and next slide, please. So I'm delighted to introduce Ali Gardner. She's an assistant professor in the School of Biology and Ecology, the center, uh, the, and the Senator George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions and the Graduate School of Biomedical Science and Engineering at the University of Maine. Her research fo focuses on the ecology of infectious diseases of humans and wildlife that are transmitted by arthropod vectors. Current projects include studying the invasion of black-legged tick and Lyme disease in Maine and understanding the interactions between risk of exposure to vector-borne disease and economic interests, for example, in the timber harving, harvesting and tourism industries and at the local and, and international spatial scales. So Ali, welcome to, uh, to today. Um, and uh, Ali also just told me that uh, she, she lives in the woods with weak internet, so she may turn off her, um, her video uh, so uh, to make sure that we have uh, good enough bandwidth for you. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so before we dive into the materials, uh, we have some questions for you. And in a moment, you will see a poll that pops up on your screen. There are no right and wrong answers. We just uh, want to be able to get a gauge of who is here and how knowledgeable people are who are on the call. And it's helpful for Ali in knowing um, how to do the presentation and what uh, kind of depth to get into. So you'll see the questions here, if you can just click on them. And uh, once you've completed all of them, um, it will uh, allow you to submit it and then we'll share it with the rest of you. So we're going to give you a couple of minutes to do that and I'll just be quiet while that happens. And, um, and we'd love your input. Okay, so you can see um, a level of knowledge about forest management and tick ecology. Uh, most people are somewhat knowledgeable. We have a couple of very knowledgeable people. Um, and um, knowledge of forest management and tick-borne pathogen transmission dynamics, the same, uh, somewhat knowledgeable. And um, uh, knowledge of, of landowners' tick-borne disease risk uh, perceptions is somewhat knowledgeable and um, not at all knowledgeable in how I, 
and landowners' willingness to actively manage their forested lands for ticks. So um, that hopefully uh, that, um, that Ali will be able to uh, shift the needle on that during her presentation. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Ali. All right, well, thanks very much um, for inviting me uh, for this opportunity to talk with you all about uh, forest management and tick-borne disease exposure risk. Um, so I am going to turn off uh, my, uh, my webcam um, for now. I uh, just got a problem with my home internet connection where it's a little tough to run both the screen sharing and the webcam at the same time. Um, but rest assured that I am still here. Um, so again, I'm Allie Gardner. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maine in Orno. Um, and so, yeah, so my goal for the presentation today is to uh, discuss a little bit of our research that we've recently been conducting here um, related to uh, forest management and tick-borne disease transmission dynamics. Um, and some of the work I'm going to discuss here is going to touch uh, not only upon the ecology of tick-borne disease transmission, uh, but also um, some work related to uh, how forest landowners perceive tick-borne disease risk and how they perceive their own role um, in managing tick-borne disease uh, transmission risk. So um, I want to start off uh, just to, again with a brief overview of the, uh, of the black-legged tick life cycle. And I know that I'm uh, in the late stages of a long series of uh, webinars related to this topic. So um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar already. Um, but part of the reason why uh, Lyme disease and other pathogens transmitted by the black-legged tick are so challenging to manage um, is because of the complex life cycle uh, of the black-legged tick. Um, so ticks have a two-year life cycle um, with multiple molts um, from larva to nymph and from nymph to adult. And at each molt, they need to feed on a host um, to take a blood meal. Uh, in order to progress with the life cycle. Um, so for the larvae and the nymphs, uh, which are the life stages that are generally active in the spring and summer, um, uh, typically the blood meal hosts are small mammals, um, including a number of different hosts. They carry Borrelia burgdorferi um, bacterium that causes Lyme disease. And then for the adults, um, the blood meal hosts, uh, which they typically feed on around uh, uh, the fall and sometimes in the early spring as well, um, the hosts typically are larger mammals um, like deer or dogs or people. And so this diversity of uh, hosts that the ticks interact with uh, throughout the life cycle um, makes uh, ticks and tick-borne pathogens really challenging um, to manage uh, because there are you know, just so many different uh, phases to the life cycle and so many different uh, types of interactions with varied wildlife hosts. Um, and, in, and although a lot of, uh, you know, tick-borne disease related research focuses on uh, tick interactions with wildlife because that's where the uh, potential for pathogen transmission occurs, uh, the reality is that the ticks spend about 90% of their life cycle off host um, where abiotic conditions can potentially uh, alter uh, tick densities in the environment as well. Um, so, so just uh, some broad perspective of what the tick life cycle looks like um, as we move into the discussion of um, management strategies. Now, for, uh, forest management as a tool for tick-borne disease management, I think is very appealing uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, the first reason why I think that this is such an appealing approach uh, for tick-borne disease management is because uh, forest management may impact tick host encounter frequencies and off host abiotic conditions for ticks throughout the entire life cycle. Uh, so there are multiple points um, throughout the life cycle and the pathogen transmission cycle um, where forest management can potentially um, inhibit uh, density of ticks and tick infection prevalence. Um, so for example, um, there's a lot of evidence in the literature uh, that forest management can impact white-tailed deer density and white-tailed deer activity um, and potentially encounter frequencies between deer and black-legged ticks. Um, typically, white-tailed deer are associated with an increase in the density of infected nymphs uh, because they're such an important blood meal host uh, for ticks in the uh, nymph and adult stages. 
Um, continuing along the wildlife theme, uh, forest management also can impact the densities and ecology and behavior of rodents. Um, so rodents we know are some of the most important blood meal hosts uh, for, the, uh, for the juvenile life stages, for the larvae and for the nymphs. And they also include many of the most confident reservoir hosts for a variety of tick-borne pathogens. So in general, uh, when we have high rodent densities, we'll expect to see a higher density of nymphs as well as a higher nymphal infection prevalence, um, leading to increased potential for pathogen transmission um, to humans and to other uh, various hosts. Uh, similarly, there's evidence that forest management can impact the ecology of predators of rodents. Um, so for example, uh, if we uh, you know, undertake forest management practices that might uh, promote uh, the presence of predators and promote high biodiversity in the forest environment, um, these predators of rodents might feed on rodents, reduce the rodent population, and result in a net decrease in the nymphal infection prevalence. So all of these uh, you know, wildlife related pathways are ways that forest management potentially can stand to impact um, the ecology of tick-borne disease transmission and tick-borne disease exposure risk. Um, and, uh, and then again, as I mentioned, 90% of the life cycle for the tick actually is spent off host. And there's potential for uh, forest management to influence tick ecology during that portion of the life cycle as well. Um, so for instance, there's evidence that uh, leaf litter in the forest can provide insulation uh, during the winter, uh, potentially increasing off host um, tick overwinter survival. So our management uh, practices in the forest um, can, among other things, have implications for, um, for that, you know, that leaf, layer, uh, leaf litter layer um, that's going to protect the, um, the ticks during the winter. Um, and then during the, uh, the spring and summer months when ticks are more typically active, uh, forest management can potentially influence microclimate conditions um, such as humidity. Uh, and humidity we know is closely related to off-host tick survival um, to a point the ticks are more likely to survive and be active in a more humid environment. Um, and so this is another uh, feature of the environment that can really be altered by our forest management practices. Um, so there's a lot of potential here for forest management to, uh, to impact uh, ticks yeah, throughout this entire life cycle, um, which is really, I think, I think very appealing um, since as we saw in the, in the life cycle diagram on the previous slide, uh, there are so many different uh, points in the tick life cycle that could reasonably be targets for management efforts. A second reason uh, why uh, forest management is very appealing as a tick-borne disease risk management strategy is because there also is an opportunity here for tick-borne disease management efforts to complement landowners' other aims for their forest. Um, uh, landowners, uh, private landowners especially, have many different types of objectives uh, for their privately owned woodland. Um, this figure here shows a landowner typology analysis that was conducted in 2011. Uh, what the authors did here was they conducted a, a social science survey of, uh, of you know, a, a bunch of different uh, private woodland owners, um, like what we, um, you know, know, we see many of them here in New England. And they categorized all of these landowners if, into different groups, depending um, using a cluster analysis, depending on what their personal aims were for how they wanted to use their private woodlands. And so you can see here that there are a lot of different uh, owner groups that have different priorities for their privately managed land. Um, some of them you can see in, in, you know, in one category are very financially oriented. Um, so perhaps uh, these landowners are going to be interested in harvesting timber on their properties um, to turn a profit on their properties. Um, we have other, uh, and so if we were able to find uh, tick-borne disease management strategies that are connected to timber harvesting in some fashion, uh, that might be appealing to those uh, landowners that there's kind of an added benefit uh, from their financially beneficial economic practice, um, uh, management practices to also reduce tick-borne disease exposure. Um, we've got some landowners that are more oriented toward conservation, um, who, for instance, might be trying to um, increase wildlife diversity on their property. Um, and so you can imagine um, that, uh, that if certain management practices would not only 
uh, increase wildlife diversity on their land, but also would inhibit uh, tick-borne disease risk, that might be very appealing to those types of landowners. And so, you know, the list goes on. Uh, people who are using their land for personal enjoyment might have a really vested interest in removing invasive plants in their forests uh, so they can actually, you know, get through their forest and not be just uh, traipsing through thickets of barberry, for instance. Um, and so you can see here that, that there are a lot of different ways that uh, management practices that could serve to inhibit tick-borne disease transmission also could be appealing to landowners in terms of their other objectives. And so uh, my goal for this presentation, um, I'm going to go through this in, um, in five parts. Uh, my, my first uh, uh, item that I'm going to go through, I'm going to highlight my own lab's research concerning the impacts of timber harvesting on tick-borne disease transmission dynamics. And this is ongoing research right now. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the preliminary data that's been collected in my lab uh, over the past couple years. And then um, I'll talk about some of our ongoing and future research plans as well and the directions that we're trying to take this work. Second, I'll highlight briefly some other examples of the impacts of active, active forest management on human risk of exposure to tick-borne disease. Um, there are a good number of studies in the literature on this topic. So I'll spend some time uh, just giving an overview of research that were conducted by groups, um, uh, by other groups related to invasive plant management and prescribed burns in particular. Um, I'm also going to try to place these management strategies in the context of forest landowner objectives and their decision-making processes, which I think is a really understudied uh, aspect of, um, of this idea of uh, tick-borne disease management through forest management. Uh, forest landowners really need to be actively involved in this process in order for this to be an effective strategy. Um, and so I think that this is a case where we really can learn from social science research as well um, in order to devise uh, solutions that are going to be effective um, for tick-borne disease exposure risk management. And then finally, I'm going to discuss uh, very briefly uh, the impacts of forest management on tick-borne disease transmission at the landscape scale in contrast to much of the other work that I'll talk about that's going to be centered on the property scale. So um, I, I want to start off just by talking briefly about the context of Lyme disease transmission that we're looking at here in Maine, uh, which is where a lot of my examples are going to focus. Um, so in Maine, we have this you know, very interesting socio-ecological context here because we have so much woodland area, um, especially in areas of the state uh, with very high Lyme disease incidents that are privately owned. Um, so this is a map of Lyme disease cases per 100,000 individuals uh, from 2010 to 2020 uh, by the town level in Maine. And so you can see that a lot of our cases are concentrated in, um, in southern and coastal Maine and ticks have been spreading throughout the state over the past couple decades and we anticipate we'll continue to do so. This is a map here of non-industrial private forest land ownership. Um, and you can see here that the areas of southern Maine that have the highest Lyme disease prevalence um, are largely managed by private landowners rather than by commercial interests. Over 80% of the land in the southern and coastal Maine area uh, is privately owned. Um, so family landowners are effectively controlling the ecological conditions that may alternatively enhance or inhibit Lyme disease transmission. So it's really critical to understand how their decisions impact transmission and whether certain management decisions could mitigate the problem of Lyme disease in Maine. All right, so, um, so what we're looking at here again uh, is, is another uh, landowner typology um, that, uh, that is uh, specific to Maine. Um, so this is research that was conducted in 2015 um, that categorizes uh, Maine private landowners into six different categories. And so again, you can see that, um, that we have some landowners who are really interested in production, um, some that are more interested in protection and conservation. Um, we've got a few uh, landowners that are interested in, la in their forest land as you know, consumption and amenities, many different recreationist groups as well. Um, and then there are a few uh, landowner categories that are either passive, meaning that they don't, um, they're not really seeking to manage their land at all, uh, or multi-objective, uh, which will be like our more complex group where we've got uh, landowners who are seeking to satisfy multiple objectives. 
And so uh, one of my master's students, Christine Conti, um, a couple years ago for her master's thesis, um, conducted a project um, where she compared uh, 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 where she compared um, the number of uh, black-legged tick nymphs that we're seeing in areas that have been recently harvested uh, versus unharvested uh, within the past 20 years. The reason she chose to focus her research on timber harvesting is because this is one of the activities, the management activities that really dominates all categories of uh, landowner typologies in Maine. Um, most categories of private landowners in Maine have an interest in timber harvesting um, there hasn't been much research to date considering what the impacts of timber harvesting could be on tick-borne disease transmission. So Christine's study was one of the first that, um, that demonstrated that there could be um, this impact of timber harvesting, at least recent timber harvesting, on the densities of ticks. What she found in her fieldwork is that in general, um, the densities of uh, nymphal black-legged ticks um, is lower at sites that were harvested recently um, so within zero to five years ago, compared to a control site nearby that was harvested greater than 20 years ago. And in her work, Christine also explored some of the mechanisms um, that, uh, you know, we thought could possibly underlie these patterns. And it was interesting, she did find um, that uh, the uh, white-footed mouse uh, densities also uh, generally were lower in these more recently harvested habitats compared to the control habitats. Um, but what she really found uh, seemed to be the key driver of this difference in number of ticks was the impacts of harvesting on microclimate conditions. And in particular, um, in, these really harvest, in, the, in these recently harvested habitats, uh, temperatures overall were much higher at questing height, um, humidity was much lower. And so it seems like, you know, although you know, we don't have a full understanding as to whether these conditions were impacting uh, tick survival or tick questing activity. It did seem that uh, tick host encounter frequencies likely would be reduced um, by, uh, uh, the, by harvesting uh, via these effects on microclimate conditions. All right, so I guess we'll take the pause here to, uh, to talk about questions. Yeah, we had three questions and uh, two of them you may be covering further on, but I'll read them out just uh, in case uh, you're not or you can be aware of them as you go forward. So the first one is by Michael Roberts and he says invasive earthworms largely remove uh, leaf layer from the forest floors. Any data on the relationship between this worm species and tick survival? That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, research that's been conducted uh, to that effect. Uh, but it is actually something that uh, landowners have pointed out to me um, in, as part of a citizen science project that I'm going to talk about in a few slides. Um, uh, so, uh, so no, there isn't really any, any research that I'm aware of, although it, it does seem to make sense intuitively that, um, that the earthworm activity could stand to impact um, the, the, micro, uh, the microhabitat conditions for the ticks off host. Great. And the next two questions you may cover um, as we go through, but I'm going to read them out. Um, Stephen uh, Bremer said, in addition to leaf litter, snow cover is another protective factor for the immature, immature stages. Mm -hmm. How or what forest management practices can affect this protective snow cover? And an anonymous person asked, leaf litter is critical for some uh, bird species like the hermit thrush. I'm curious if your recommendations and strategies take into consideration other ecological factors like this? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so to answer the first question, um, the research that we've been conducting uh, so far has not addressed the impacts of uh, management practices on snowfall on the ground, but, but as, the, um, as, the, as uh, the person pointed out, um, we also have conducted uh, research in the context of other projects in my group about the impacts um, of the combination of leaf litter and snowfall um, on uh, off-host uh, tick survival during the winter. And we've seen the exact same pattern that, that you're describing, that, um, that, the, that the interaction between the two has been very important um, for tick survival over winter, um, including in some of our northern uh, study locations where we've worked in Maine. Um, and so I think that that's an interesting question. It's, it's certainly a, a an area that we're hoping to approach in our research in the future for a couple reasons. Um, at first, as you know, as we've talked about, 
uh, the implications of snowfall for overwinter tick survival. Second, also the implications of snowfall for deer activity. Um, it, uh, you know, we, we know that um, the snowfall also can impact deer activity um, and that deer are less likely to be active in areas with heavy snowfall, which could potentially have um, implications for uh, ticks that get kind of dropped in those habitats throughout the winter and, um, and I mean, in Maine, winter lasts until May. So, uh, so I think that there are multiple perspectives through which um, timber harvesting impacts on snowfall could uh, could alter the ecology of the Lyme disease system. Um, I'm sorry, could you remind me of the second question? Yeah, the second one is leaf litter is <clears throat> critical for some bird species like the hermit thrush. I'm curious if your recommendations and strategies take into consideration other ecological factors like this. Yes, so there's a lot of evidence that um, that uh, timber harvesting can impact many different wildlife species in different ways. Um, in general, active forest management is thought to promote uh, biodiversity of different species. And, uh, and I don't really think that it's possible um, for timber harvesting to completely eliminate uh, the existence of leaf litter um, in the environment. So I'm inclined to think that, um, that, uh, that some, some leaf litter loss that would inhibit um, tick activity would probably not uh, impact, probably would not be to a great enough extent to impact like all species in the environment. Um, but that being said, uh, the research that we've worked on to date um, is strictly focused on the impacts on wildlife as related to tick-borne disease transmission. Yeah, great. And we have some more questions that are coming in, but we'll leave those for the next break. So. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next phase of the research um, that we're moving into right now is considering the effects of silviculture on uh, Lyme transmission dynamics. Um, so uh, in the preliminary studies that we've conducted, again, we've, con we've considered this relatively narrow scenario where we're looking at um, a stand that's been harvested within the past um, zero to five years and comparing it to a control stand. Um, but this is really agnostic to um, the silviculture treatment, um, and, uh, and obviously we're only considering one uh, time point for timber harvesting. And so our ongoing research is trying to address this more broadly and understand whether there are any potential impacts of silviculture uh, treatments um, on tick-borne pathogen transmission dynamics. I think that this cuts to some of the other questions as well. Um, certainly some silviculture treatments have stronger impacts on the entire environment compared to others. And so we do have a, you know, a vested interest in understanding uh, which silviculture treatments are most likely to um, affect the desired outcomes on tick-borne disease exposure risk while minimizing um, impact on potentially other wildlife species. So as part of this study, um, we've been uh, considering a variety of different um, silviculture treatments. Um, so clear cutting is really the most extreme technique um, that involves like, you know, wholesale removal of trees over large uh, areas of land. Um, and then there are also um, other, you know, even aged and um, uneven aged silviculture treatments, uh, basically schemes for deciding which subsets of trees to remove that could potentially have uh, variable impacts on wildlife communities that could cascade down um, to, uh, to tick-borne disease transmission. Um, and so we think that there are a few different uh, mechanisms by which silviculture treatments could potentially uh, stand to impact uh, tick-borne disease transmission. Um, first pathway that we're considering is the impact on microhabitat features. Um, so again, temperature, humidity, and leaf litter cover are all expected to be impacted in different ways depending on the silviculture practice that's being used. Um, so for instance, clear cutting, um, which is our, our most extreme scenario, um, we would expect to have perhaps the strongest impacts. Uh, whereas uh, some of the other techniques, you know, like single tree selection, for instance, we would expect to have the most minimal impacts on variables like leaf litter cover and potentially other uh, features of the abiotic environment. Um, the second uh, mechanistic pathway that we're considering as part of this work is the impact of um, silviculture on wildlife communities. Um, and so in particular, we're focused on understanding the impact on vertebrate host diversity overall. 
um, since host diversity uh, has in some systems been linked um, to Lyme disease transmission dynamics. Uh, we're interested in the impacts on white-footed mouse density and abundance as one of the principal reservoir hosts for tick-borne pathogens. And we're also interested in how silviculture treatment affects white-tailed deer density due to their important role as a reproductive host uh, for black-legged ticks. Um, and again, this choice of silviculture method is going to be um, you know, one of the major decisions that all landowners need to make while they're harvesting their forests so they can take these pathways into account. Uh, potentially in their decision making. And so the idea here is that um, both microhabitat habitat features and wildlife communities together um, could alter the abundance and density of black-legged ticks in the environment. Um, wildlife communities uh, could impact uh, tick-borne uh, disease pathogen prevalence uh, as well, um, especially as related to densities of key reservoir hosts. And so collectively, these different pathways would contribute to overall tick-borne disease exposure risk. Um, and so this is the focus of a current project um, that we're working on in Southern Maine. Um, this project is being led by one of my uh, graduate students, um, Stephanie Hurd. And the project is in its second field season right now. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the design of the study um, and then uh, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, have, we'll have some, some findings over the next couple of years. Um, but, uh, but basically the way the design of the study worked uh, was that we selected field sites using stocking guides, um, which are tools that are used by foresters um, that consider both uh, trees per acre and the basal area per acre um, to, uh, to guide silviculture treatments in order to achieve specific management aims. Um, and so the reason why we started by considering these stocking guides is because we want to ensure that the findings of the research uh, readily will be able to translate back to a management context. And the way the study is laid out, we've got uh, five locations um, or blocks uh, in different towns in southern Maine. Um, we've got three experimental units within each block um, that roughly correspond um, to different areas of the stocking curve. Um, so some areas are just um, much more uh, heavily harvested than others. Um, when you look at the stocking guide, if we're you know below the um, the C line or below the B and the C line, um, that's going to be a more heavily harvested area between the A and the B line will be moderately harvested area. And then above the A line is going to be a pretty dense um, uh, overstory canopy. Um, and so within each experimental unit, uh, we've been collecting a variety of different type of data to try to understand these mechanistic pathways um, by which silviculture um, could potentially stand to alter tick-borne disease exposure risk. Um, so during the first year of the study, we, you know, we took detailed vegetation measurements um, for both understory and overstory. And it seems in the preliminary data analyses that the understory vegetation um, seems to be much more strongly correlated to, uh, to tick densities overall compared to the overstory uh, forest characteristics, which was an interesting result and consistent with what we've seen um, in some of, some of the published literature. Um, we've also been conducting off-post tick dragging along uh, transects on a grid, um, trapping small mammals to assess um, uh, uh, rodent population size, conducting trail camera surveys and deer scat surveys for wildlife, monitoring temperature and humidity at the soil level and also at tick questing height. And ultimately, we're going to be conducting tick-borne pathogen assays to try and get an understanding not only of how all these variables could affect um, density of nymphs, but also nymphal infection prevalence. And so this is ongoing work, um, but, uh, but really the key takeaway um, so far is that, uh, that, that silviculture does seem to have an impact on the tick densities we're seeing, and it generally seems to be driven um, largely by uh, the, the impacts of silviculture on what the understory looks like. Uh, where a more heavily harvested area is going to tend to have a more dense um, understory with more sunlight. And so uh, this research is going on this summer um, on a more limited scale uh, due to the pandemic uh, and we'll be continuing to monitor this study um, and to be able to come up with recommendations. I also want to take a moment to highlight uh, some of the other research that's been done, not by me, uh, related to uh, uh, forest active forest management practices and uh, tick-borne disease transmission. 
Um, and there are numerous previous studies that demonstrate that invasive plant removal, for example, um, reduces tick-borne disease exposure risk um, by various pathways. Um, so this was a study conducted in 2009 uh, by Scott Williams, um, really well-known study concerning the impacts of uh, barberry, invasive uh, Japanese barberry management on uh, ticks and tick-borne pathogens, um, where this study documented um, that, uh, you know, really extraordinarily high uh, tick densities in areas that were heavily infested with Japanese barberry um, and uh, in areas where barberry had been actively managed and controlled, um, tick densities are much lower. In fact, not at all statistically different from areas that had no barberry at all. Um, so this is a really well-known study, um, uh, you know, one of a great set of papers um, concerning this potential imp this impact of active forest management on tick-borne disease number of different hypothesized mechanisms as to why this would be the case. Um, some related to deer activity, um, uh, impacts of barberry on deer activity, some related to um, uh, impacts of barberry on microclimate conditions. Um, here's another study. This wasn't focused on the black-legged tick, but, um, but on the Lone Star tick um, conducted by Brian Allen in 2010. Um, so this was a, a study that investigated um, the removal of uh, invasive honeysuckle uh, on, um, on uh, densities and abundance of lone star ticks. And again, here, um, the study also found that uh, removal of honeysuckle um, dramatically reduced the number of lone star ticks um, at the stand level and also uh, dramatically reduced the, uh, the density of deer uh, associated with those habitats. Um, so that's kind of the mechanistic pathway by which um, invasive plants are thought to uh, reduce densities of lone star ticks. There also have been a series of studies uh, that have considered the impacts of prescribed burns on tick ecology. Um, tick densities generally um, have been demonstrated to be reduced in the immediate aftermath of prescribed burns, although the tick populations do appear to rebound after a certain amount of time goes by in the absence of continued active management. Um, so this was a study published in 2019, um, uh, again, focused on the Lone Star tick that demonstrated that in the immediate aftermath of uh, prescribed burns, the number of Lone Star ticks did decline, although in the absence of ongoing management, um, the number of ticks would dramatically rebound, um, which is most likely a result of um, the uh, the growth of the shrub layer and re-sprouts uh, in the aftermath of the burn that would provide uh, good habitat for the ticks as well as for um, their key hosts. Um, another study in 1998 by Kirby Stafford, um, this one focused on the black-legged tick as well, showed a similar pattern um, where when uh, prescribed burns were conducted, um, this really did reduce the density of black-legged ticks uh, relative to a control in the immediate aftermath of the burn. Um, but again, it's possible that the number of ticks could go up um, during successive years after the burn um, if, the, uh, if the management regimen isn't maintained. Um, and so I think that something uh, like a pattern that we can draw across all of these examples is that there is a very strong temporal dimension um, to the impacts of active forest management on tick-borne disease transmission and across really all different types of management. Um, there does seem to be accumulating evidence that management must occur regularly in order for the benefits um, of management to be sustained. Um, so this is uh, an example of uh, one, uh, one of the only long-term studies I'm aware of, of the impacts of invasive uh, plant management on, uh, on uh, tick exposure and, um, and tick-borne pathogen exposure over time. Um, this was, again, conducted by um, Scott Williams down at Connecticut Ag Station in 2017. They tracked um, uh, managed uh, plots that have been managed for invasive barberry over a nine year period. And they found that, um, that the, the lower densities uh, associated with barberry management were maintained over time, um, but only as a result of management that occurred on a continual basis. Um, so the management really needs to be maintained in order to continue to um, gain the benefits. I'll take another break for questions. Great, and we have lots of good questions that have come in. 
Uh, one is a comment that you may want to follow up on afterwards, but uh, Gary Fish said, we're considering putting in a suggestion to USDA to fund a citizen science survey for um, aminthus worms, slugs, and snails. And he's very interested in uh, what your project is looking at. So I think yeah, that's more that, Yeah, please, uh, I, would, I would love to follow up. Um, uh, I think my email address is probably available somewhere. Uh, Yes. We'll, we'll figure out a way to connect. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Great. So, uh, Michael Gallagher said, um, have you or anyone that you know of done any work that looks at how behavior of critical tick hosts, deer, mice, shrews, chipmunks, etc., changes with forest management activities in ways that might affect tick density? And could this change uh, the aggregation and distribution of ticks? That's a really great question. Um, and yes, this is certainly one of our interests and it's a topic that has been addressed in the context of a few management practices. Uh, uh, there has been some work on how, uh, how timber harvesting in particular um, impacts the behavior and even the personalities of small mammals. Um, uh, and so uh, one, of our, one of our research interests uh, in moving ahead is really um, in a, uh, yeah, and how uh, tick host encounter frequencies uh, could be altered by management, even if it turns out that uh, the density or abundance of, um, of rodents is not altered by management. Um, so for example, in a harvested area in general, um, small mammals are more likely to spend, hiding, uh, spend time hiding um, from predators and they're less likely to spend significant amount of time foraging. Um, one could imagine, although this hasn't been studied in the context of tick-borne disease in particular, one could readily imagine uh, where if uh, rodents are less active and spending more time sheltering than foraging, um, they would be less likely to encounter uh, ticks. And so this is one, uh, even if the, the population size of the rodents were the same in the managed area versus the unmanaged area, um, you still might expect to see reduced tick host encounter frequencies strictly as a result of the change in rodent behavior. And so this is an area that we're really interested in moving into um, in the future. Um, and there has been demonstration, especially in the invasive plant systems and the barberry system, um, the invasive honeysuckle system um, that, uh, well, just to take the example from the invasive honeysuckle and the Lone Star ticks, um, the study that I cited found that deer were much more likely to aggregate and browse in areas that were highly infested with invasive plants. So that was thought to be one of the primary mechanisms by which um, tick densities were increasing in those habitats. Um, I think it's a really interesting point. It's a great point. Okay, great. Um, and then Thomas Mather asked, um, uh, could you discuss how the nymph abundance study in the five versus the 20 year forest were controlled for location in the endemic area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so in both of these studies, we used a block design where we had two sites that were located um, within five kilometers of each other um, because there is a lot of, uh, there, there is a lot of variation in, across space in, uh, in tick densities for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with management practices. Um, so in the, uh, in the initial pilot study, uh, we had uh, uh, five study areas um, that each had uh, you know, two treatments within each of the blocks that were located relatively close to each other. Um, uh, that initial study was conducted up here, like in Hancock County, um, a bit closer to Orono, and like think around the Bar Harbor area. And then for the study that we're currently conducting of silviculture in Southern Maine, it's a similar layout. Uh, we've got uh, actually five different, well, five different properties, four of which belong to land trust and one of which is uh, Massabesic Experimental Forest. Um, and so all of these um, are like demonstration forests where um, active management is conducted and, uh, and all of the, the, um, the treatment groups that we're using within the block are very close to each other to account for that variation across the, in tick densities across this um, endemic area. Great, thank you. And uh, we have more questions, um, but I think we'll move on and we'll answer some more questions after the next section. Um, but I want to point out one comment that someone made that might be of interest to folks. Uh, Raymond Rainbolt said, with regards to invasive species on Fort Drum, New York, we found that the invasive buckthorn is a tick desert 
presumably due to the lack of ground cover that uh, grows and the lack of leaf litter that accumulates. That's quite interesting. Yeah, a little bit of a different um, scenario from the uh, from the barberry and the honeysuckle. Huh, that's interesting. Thanks. All right, lovely. So we will move on and hopefully we'll answer some uh, more questions towards the end. All right, so um, the, the next kind of phase of this, the last phase of this, I want to spend some time talking about um, Lyme disease as a socio-ecological system and kind of putting that back in the context of uh, landowner decision making. Um, so a lot of this work right, that I'm talking about right now um, related to um, timber harvesting has been um, supported by an interdisciplinary USDA grant um, that involves collaboration between um, ecologists and social scientists um, to try to understand this entire system and the feedbacks that could exist between um, uh, uh, tick and, and tick-borne disease and uh, landowners' uh, decision-making as to how to work with their forest land. Um, so uh, I think that this kind of like bottom half of this diagram it, um, has been well studied in the context of active forest management and other systems. It's been the focus of much of the research that I've been talking about um, so far this morning. Um, land use and land cover change can result in changes in composition of forest communities, composition of wildlife communities, and all of that is thought to feed, feed back to influence um, tick and tick-borne um, disease prevalence. What I'm going to talk about for this other component, and again, this is all just kind of preliminary data at this stage, um, is the flip side of the issue. Can tick and tick-borne disease prevalence uh, potentially alter uh, landowner decision-making? and willingness to manage their land in ways that could serve to inhibit uh, tick-borne disease risk. Um, we think that it's possible that um, uh, tick and tick-borne disease exposure could influence landowner perceptions um, and attitudes about management of their own forests, um, as well as their attitudes and perceptions concerning tick-borne disease, which could in turn stand to alter landowner decision-making and feedback um, into the biological component of this cycle. And so I'm going to talk about the social science work uh, very briefly. I'm not a social scientist. Uh, and so this is a, a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. But this is certainly a, a project that I've been working on uh, closely with my colleagues, Jessica Leahy and Carly Spinarski at UMaine, um, who are both environmental social scientists. So I'll talk a little bit about the work that they've been conducting. Um, so this work has been led by Katy Perry, who is a master's student here at UMaine. Um, and the goal of the social science component of this project that we've been working on collaboratively is to characterize the ways in which private woodlot owners try to incorporate tick-borne disease prevention into their woodlot management decisions, as well as how willing they would be to adapt their management behavior to reduce the risk of tick-borne disease exposure in the future. And so the approach with this study um, is we've been, uh, the team has been conducting um, different types of uh, surveys with private landowners who own um, a minimum of uh, 10 acres of land um, in southern and coastal Maine. So the same general uh, study areas that we've been working at um, for the ecological research. Um, so this is just uh, one example um, in, uh, of how the survey rolled out in New Gloucester. Um, there were two different methods used for the survey research. One of them is called the drop-off pickup method. Uh, where the researcher leaves the survey like sitting outside the home and, uh, and asks the resident, um, the property owner to complete the survey and then goes and picks up the survey at their home. And they've also been conducting a mail survey uh, where the survey gets mailed to the private landowners. Um, and so as you can see here, the yields of these survey uh, types are very different um, with the drop-off uh, pickup survey the response rate has been nearly 70%, uh, which was a number that you know, we were all very happy with during the first field season. And this survey actually is going out again um, this summer to some new locations as well to increase the sample size. Mail survey yield was a little bit lower, uh, but we still got you know, a decent number of replies there. And so um, the survey focuses on asking uh, landowners different types of questions. Um, so this is just an example of what the survey looks like. Um, uh, landowners were asked a variety of questions about how they try to protect themselves personally um, against uh, tick-borne disease exposure. And then they also were asked questions about how they manage their properties and about um, 
um, their willingness to manage their property um, to better manage tick-borne disease risk. Bottom line, one of the major findings of the survey so far is that a lot of landowners just are not aware of the impacts of forest management, um, including burns, invasive plant removal, timber harvesting on tick-borne disease transmission. And yet, all three of these management practices, I'd say especially timber harvesting and removal of invasives, are very compatible with a lot of the landowners' goals for their own properties. Um, so uh, still working on the data analysis for these larger surveys and finishing up this uh, second field season with the surveys. But I think that the, um, at least the initial findings are very interesting, suggestive that um, there might be a way for these, you know, these tick management practices um, to be compatible with landowners' goals and that um, increasing landowner education concerning um, tick-borne disease exposure risk in the context of forest management could be uh, potentially a fruitful path um, for, uh, for management in the environment. We've also been conducting um, a large citizen science uh, project uh, this summer, um, the Maine Forest Tick Survey, which is being led by Alyssa Ballman um, to try to uh, you know, increase the number of properties that we have information about. Um, so this is an active tick surveillance uh, citizen science project. Um, this summer, we have 125 uh, citizen scientist participants enrolled, um, and an additional 125 at minimum um, are going to be enrolled uh, next summer as well. It's turned out that citizen science has been a very popular activity during the pandemic while we're all staying at home. Uh, and so we've been, I guess we're lucky that we've been able to capitalize on the desire to be outside on your own property uh, during this summer. Um, but all the citizen scientists involved in the project are located in Southern and coastal Maine and they all own woodlots that are greater than 10 acres in size. Um, and so we've been teaching the participants through, um, you know, like webinar videos, uh, how to drag for ticks on their own land. Um, and they've been doing that uh, three or four times throughout the summer. And the participants also have been filling out questionnaires about their property management history and forest management decision making. And then as we move into the fall and the spring, um, students at UMaine are going to be identifying the ticks collected to species and conducting pathogen testing in cooperation with the UMaine um, Cooperative Extension Lab. And so this project has the goal of increasing our, the size of our data sets concerning both um, landowner uh, attitudes, risk perceptions, um, management goals, as well as uh, giving us a larger tick data set um, that we can use to analyze how a variety of different management practices um, potentially impact uh, tick-borne uh, disease exposure risk throughout the state. We see uh, uh, landowners undertaking a, a really wide range of management practices, some of them focused on timber harvesting, invasive plant removal, some are trying to attract deer to their properties. Some are trying to remove deer from their properties. Um, so, uh, so we expect that we'll be able to uh, get a lot of insight about the, the range of management practices and their potential impacts on ticks um, over the next couple of years. These are just some pictures from the Maine Forest Tick Survey kind of behind the scenes um, setting up uh, in the lab. Uh, um, our, some of our uh, screenshot of one of our Qualtrics surveys as well as um, some, uh, some pictures of some of our citizen scientists who are out there collecting with their drag cloths that uh, we set up and um, deliver to them. And the last point um, that I wanna wrap up on is just concerning um, ticks and forests at the landscape scale, which I think is an issue that doesn't get um, discussed quite as much as management at the property scale. Um, much of landscape scale research um, concerning human management of forests um, has focused on forest fragmentation in suburban environments. Um, but there are, I think, many different ways that forest management um, beyond simply suburbanization and habitat fragmentation can alter uh, tick-borne disease transmission dynamics. And so I think that uh, a research direction that would be valuable in the future is uh, concerns how kind of mosaics of management practices on individual forested properties um, can alter tick-borne disease exposure risk at landscape scales. Um, a lot of the research that we've been talking about, um, uh, both in the research that my group has been working on, as well as these previous studies concerning invasive plants and prescribed burns, you know, these take place at the stand level or at the property level, um, which is a great start point 
um, but it'll be really interesting to see how um, how this all plays out at the landscape scale. For example, if you cut down invasive plants or remove timber and you know and reduce uh, uh, tick densities at a property scale, um, is that going to result in greater tick densities in the surrounding area, or is it going due to a spillover effect, or is it going to result in uh, reduced tick densities in the surrounding area? Um, I think that these are some open questions um, that haven't been explored to as great a, an extent as the property scale management. Um, and as well, uh, on the social science side, how social networks among landowners influence the adoption of practices that potentially stand to benefit human health. Um, we know from extensive research on how uh, private forest landowners make decisions um, that they really do not make decisions in isolation. They make decisions based on successful examples um, from other private landowners. They make decisions um, through taking uh, training courses and continuing ed related to uh, management of forest land. And so it would be interesting in the future to have a better understanding of how these social networks among landowners um, can potentially play into um, management of, uh, of ticks at the landscape scale um, through these active forest management practices. And so that's what I've got for the slides. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to continue talking about questions. I'm gonna see if I can start my video and whether that'll work at all, but thank you so much. Great, that was really interesting. And we have lots of really good questions actually. Um, I'll just kind of pick at them randomly. Um, so uh, Calvin Norman said, is there any work looking at how, uh, at how the amount of slash from timber harvesting or how the harvest is conducted, for example, hand felling versus mechani mechanized harvesting and how they impact ticks? So that's something that we're hoping that we'll be able to capture in part through the citizen science survey. Uh, we've had some of our citizen scientists asking us, um, should they be trying to collect ticks in areas of their properties that have a lot of slash, a lot of detritus. Um, um, the, you know, there's also an interest in, uh, in how like logging roads, for instance, um, can impact um, uh, tick-borne pathogen transmission as well. So I think that there are a lot of different facets of forest management that could stand to, um, that could stand to impact um, tick ecology. And that's something that we're hoping to begin to capture uh, through through some of these broader studies captured in the citizen science work. Okay, uh, Beatrice uh, Zanter said, is there a positive or negative impact of regrowth of forest as a monoculture after harvesting versus a more diverse forest population? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I do not know the answer to that. There does seem to be uh, across uh, different active management techniques, there does seem to be um, like a bump in tech activity that you'll see associated with regrowth. Although I am not sure, uh, I'm not aware of any work that's been done concerning um, monocultures versus more diverse forests. Okay. Um, and um, Stephen uh, Bremer says, what do you do with other, tick uh, with other tick species and other arthropods that are collected? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for the most part, uh, well, with other tick species, we do collect them. Uh, we basically, like, uh, at least in the, in the ticks that were collected in the context of our field research, um, we generally do not uh, keep any other arthropods that we collect as bycatch. Um, we do collect them. Um, we do collect the bycatch and, and, uh, and work with the bycatch as part of our mosquito surveillance work that the lab is involved in. Um, but we generally leave other arthropods alone that we collect in the course of field work. Okay, great. And um, anonymous question is, could you study a chrono sequence of forest stands at varying years since harvest to see when the tick numbers rebound to the levels found in the control site? If the stand is not yet ready for harvest, but has a tick population that has rebounded, what management activities could be done, such as thinning or some other methods? Yeah, that's a lot of <laughs> several great questions rolled up in there. Um, I agree that that, um, that understanding the chronology of the impact of timber harvesting on Texas is, is really critical. And um, just to add like a, a little more perspective to some of the work that we're conducting now, um, 
uh, the, the, the first study that I showed some data from, the harvest was conducted within zero to five years prior to um, the beginning of tick collection. Uh, but for the ongoing silviculture study that we're conducting, we're looking at properties that were harvested uh, between 10 and 15 years ago. And we are seeing differences. Uh, we are seeing that, um, you know, we're not seeing the exact same effect of harvesting um, on these, at these sites that were harvested um, longer ago compared to the sites that were harvested more recently. And so again, this is one of our goals with the citizen science project. Um, we had a lot of uh, volunteers, prospective volunteers express interest. And we went through a process of prioritizing different properties to include that partially reflected the time since the most tim recent timber harvest. And so um, we're hoping, uh, and we also prioritized covering a relatively wide spatial area to address the concern about um, variation in tick densities across the endemic area um, that are independent of harvesting uh, and, and forest management strategies. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to capture some of that uh, exact idea that you're describing through the citizen science project since it isn't logistically feasible for, uh, for us to go out and do the intensive sampling. I'd say it's representing so many different um, land management histories. Um, the second part of the question, uh, I believe, addressed um, what to do if, uh, if you've got ticks, a rebounding tick population, but the, um, the property isn't ready for harvesting. That, yeah, and could, we, could use like thinning or another strategy. That's exactly uh, part of what we're trying to address with the silviculture study, um, because even if the property isn't ready for a full harvest, if we demonstrate that certain um, techniques, um, uh, including thinning, uh, have a similar effect on tick densities, that would be really valuable information for uh, forest owners who are trying to use these approaches specifically in the context of tick management. Thanks for the question. Yeah, there's some great questions in here. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Bramer asked, uh, what types of vegetation measurements do you carry out? Variety, height, uh, vegetation per unit area, and how many samples per plot? Yes, so we've been doing um, a variety of different uh, types of forest me uh, measurements and uh, our collaborator, Laura Kennefick, who works for the US Forest Service has been, um, has been uh, leading the forest measurement work. And so we, uh, we've taken um, uh, a, a lot of uh, tree measurements. Um, we've been estimating basal area, we've been estimating number of uh, trees uh, and uh, We've been looking at uh, tree species as well. Um, at the understory scale, we've been measuring, we've been categorizing um, uh, like different types of understory vegetation and different size classes. Um, we've been measuring leaf litter depth and leaf litter type. We've been measuring canopy closure for the overstory, a pretty wide range of different, um, different types of uh, forest measurements. And we've been taking measurements for the overstory at uh, 10 points over a hectare and measurements for the understory at five points over a hectare. Okay. All right. And um, another question is, um, this anonymous one too, are you studying the correlation between deer overpopulation and tick densities? In a recent Penn State webinar on forest management, I learned that unless we address the overabundance of deer, we won't be able to effectively address invasive plant species. Thus, the most important action forest owners can take is to reduce deer populations. Yeah, that, uh, that's a really great point. And, um, and we have not been working on that in the context of this work, but I, I, I do absolutely agree uh, with that point that, um, that managing deer is going to be critical. In Southern Maine, um, so, at, in, so at a lot of the sites that we've been working at, um, that are a little, you know, these large properties that are kind of uh, removed, they're not very suburban. We haven't been finding deer densities that are off the charts. And as you move further north in the state, the deer densities just become lower and lower. Um, but next year we are planning to do some field work in, um, in some of like the smaller, more fragmented areas uh, near around the Portland area. Um, this was precluded this year by the pandemic, but, um, but we're planning to move into that next year. And I expect that we'll start to see a strong association um, like you're talking about between the deer densities and, um, and uh, the ticks. Great. 
Um, and this is also anonymous. I would be interested in participating in a tick survey on our property of almost 20 acres in the north country of New York. Is there any interest in expanding the citizen science project beyond Maine? Or I guess the other question is, do you know of other folks in New York who are considering uh, uh, partnering with you? Yeah, so, um, so in terms of the citizen science project, um, on the project that we have funded now, uh, we are focused on um, Maine. I'm not sure where it's going to go in the future uh, because uh, it has been a really, um, a really interesting um, project. And I, and I know that there's a lot of variation in land management practices uh, throughout um, New England and, and the greater Northeast. Um, there are other, so I'm not, I'm not aware of um, other citizen science projects that are ongoing now. Um, where they're doing the, uh, the drag collecting, like using the drag cloth. Um, although there are many uh, ongoing citizen science projects and like places where you can uh, mail in texts that you collect on your own properties. Um, the, there's a, an app uh, called the Tick app that you can use to document texts that you find on your properties as well. This is run through, um, I think in the uh, cooperatively through the Northeastern and Midwestern Center of excellence for vector-borne disease, um, where they're doing a lot of work, like with um, individuals, like logging texts that they've found in the environment, um, and so that's another place where you can, for sure, submit them now. Okay, great. Um, and then Miles Gombos Gombosi um, asked, "What is the method for catching the ticks?" Yeah, so the method for catching the ticks um, is. Uh, let me see if I can actually scroll back to the citizen science picture. Um, uh, we're looking at it here in these pictures on the bottom. This is for black legged ticks at least. Uh, for black legged ticks what we do is uh, we have like a one meter by one meter white cloth, it's like flannel or corduroy, um, that you literally drag on the ground and the ticks will attach to anything that passes by thinking that it could be a vertebrate host that they could take a blood meal from. Um, and so this will catch ticks that are actively seeking a host. Um, we just pull them directly off the cloth and store them in the field. Um, it's a bit laborious, but a, a pretty pleasant way to spend an afternoon. Um, and then for some of the other tick species, like the lone star tick, that are more like active host seekers, you can actually set traps like baited with dry ice to collect them. Um, but lone star tick, fortunately, is not a problem that we're really dealing with here in Maine yet. So, um, so the drag collections, it is. Okay. All right, and we have just have three more, actually two more questions and one more comment. So anonymous question is, I, and I think you may have touched on this, but I don't know if there's any more to add. I, um, I understand there's a correlation between areas that have higher invasives like Japanese Barbary and the higher numbers of ticks. Have you looked at whether timber harvesting may be providing pathways for invasive species and thus a potential increase in ticks? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, this is not something that we've been working on in the current project, um, uh, but uh, but it, it, it would be, it would be interesting to consider. Um, in general, we've been finding that the people who are more likely to, um, to manage their properties for timber are more likely to be practicing other forms of management as well. Um, but yes, one could easily see how, um, the harvesting could provide pathways for the emergence of, um, invasive understory plants. So it's an interesting point. I'm going to, been taking notes throughout this entire call about all the good ideas that have been raised. I, I appreciate these thoughts. I was going to say these, these are a great set of questions. It's really great. Yeah, uh, thank you all. And uh, I also wanted to say for Miles Gombas, who asked that question about how you collected them, you may want to go back and look at the um, very first in our series, um, mm. uh, which went into some detail on different aspects of these things. And it's a, it's a good, it was a good first um, uh, presentation uh, goes into quite a few things um, more, in more depth. So, all right. And uh, from uh, Stephen uh, Bremer, if your research discovers forest management practice that significantly reduces uh, tick disease transmission, can the landowners be forced by legislation to adopt such a management process? My research um, is, is definitely not involved in the policy dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and how this would be enforced. Uh, we consider the scope of our role to, um, to make recommendations. We communicate in collaboration with Cooperative Extension and you know, we provide uh, you know, informational resources, um, but I cannot even begin to uh, venture an answer to that question so far removed from policy as I am. <laughs> okay, great. 
And the last is a comment also from Stephen. A recent Entomology Today publication showed that analysis of non-target light trap collected arthropods must be analyzed to expose interactions among arthropods in the habitat. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that recently. It's quite interesting. This has definitely motivated us to uh, to think more about some of our bycatch with the light trapping for the mosquitoes. Great. Okay, well with that we've actually answered all the questions and so if we can move to the next slide that would be great. Right, and we have some questions for you, some quick poll questions. It should take less than a minute uh, for you to answer. So you, for those folks that it shows up on the screen, if you could uh, answer these poll questions, that would be great. And I'll just be quiet while you do that. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and I can show you the results. So we've moved from somewhat knowledgeable to moderately knowledgeable in uh, most of the early questions. And um, the one that we love to see is as a result of the webinar, how likely are you to increase your implementation of IPM? And uh, the top two right there are very likely and extremely likely and a good, a good showing for moderately likely. So that's what we like to see since that is uh, our mission. Uh, so great. So if um, you could move forward the next slide, that would be great. So um, if you would enjoy working with um, Allison in any way or our other researchers in any of this other tick series, we have something called Find a Colleague where um, it allows people who are interested in IPM to connect with each other. Uh, so for researchers and farmers and uh, land managers uh, that you could put in there are what your interests are and it's a way of connecting with each other when you're putting together uh, projects. And I don't know if Ali has her uh, profile up there, but there are several, many profiles up there from all over the Northeast. And it's uh, part of fulfilling our goal uh, to make connections between, uh, between people in different states and different areas of IPM. And the next slide, please. We have uh, three more uh, webinars that are upcoming uh, in September. On September 14th, uh, we have pathogens found in ticks collected on school grounds and public parks. Um, and then at the end of the month, Andrew Lee is going to be presenting on host targeted tick control, what works, what doesn't work and what's new. And then uh, to close out the series at the end, we have Kirby Stafford, who actually began our series, uh, talking about leaf litter and snow removal for tick reduction, which will really kind of be echoing back to, uh, to what Ali was talking about today. Um, I also want to mention that um, uh, our RFA uh, request for uh, proposals is coming out uh, sometime in September. And so if you are interested in submitting to us, keep an eye out for that. Um, it'll have a due date. Uh, usually it's in mid-November. It comes out sometime in September. And um, if you're interested, you can see last year's application on our website. And, um, and then we'll be releasing the new one soon. And there'll be a webinar. Um, that will also uh, answer your questions um, about the upcoming RFA. We actually funded a project with Ali, and, um, and so this is uh, a good way for us to fund interesting uh, research across the region and interesting projects. So next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder, there's gonna be a recording of this that's available uh, within the next week. And the next slide. And just want to acknowledge uh, USDA NIFR, who funds, um, funds our center. And uh, through that grant, of course, the other subgrants that we make to uh, researchers such as Ali. And there's also an acknowledgement page for Ali, um, for NIFR, NSF, uh, the National Park Service, and um, the EPA and her collaborators. So um, I want to end with just saying thank you very much for your great questions and, uh, and thank you to Ali for her wonderful, thoughtful research and presentation and uh, for all of the work and commitment and long hours that has gone into um, being able to answer those questions so beautifully and put this presentation together. So I acknowledge you for, for the life that you've, that you've lived to make it possible. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and thanks everyone for your great questions. Okay, great. All right. And with that, we will end our presentation.